Part 2 of Grace and Peace Being Prepared Before their eyes, seeing an ark being prepared. Before their eyes, hearing the truth proclaimed Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Live our lives as Christians not just on Sundays, but throughout the week and for our entire lives. Because none of us knows when the final second minute hour will come as being awake prepared the king is coming so let me get to the nitty gritty us as Christians need and I say this equally for myself to be prepared at all times why because the king is coming He might not come today. You might die today. But rest assured, Jesus Christ is coming. And that's why we are to be prepared. And I want to get very deeply into this morning about being prepared. I want, I want this to be a shock factor for you. In fact, I want this to be a sort of a fear factor for you. Because sometimes fear brings wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That's indeed if you are someone that belongs to Jesus this morning. And if you don't, if, you, if you're kind of in between, and we need to talk. The point is we need to live our lives in the complete preparedness. That is to say we are to continually shame and you and any other person in any other church old age home, any other house who calls themselves a Christian, live our lives as Christians not just on Sundays, but throughout the week and for our entire lives, because none of us knows when the final second minute hour will come. Hence, Priscilla. Let me remind you of this. That there's just too much religiosity happening in the lives of so many Christians, or can I say so-called Christians these days, but there's no personal relationship with Jesus. No, there's, no, there's nothing personal. As I told the older people, I'll tell you the same. You want to get personal with Jesus, get to know Him in His Word. That's how you get personal with Him. You don't just go and, oh, uh, uh, I hope you'll get personal. You get personal with Him because you fall in love with the Christ that is spoken about from Genesis through Revelation. That's how you fall in love with Jesus. And have a personal relationship with Him. And it's with the living God and the one who saves. Jesus Christ. There are warnings, family. Warnings, I told you in the beginning, I'm going to say it again, there are warnings throughout the pages of Scripture. Uh, right through. Warning after warning. Because it is not the desire of God, the Bible tells us, that the wicked would perish. It's not his desire. He's not a capricious, malicious, hateful God that he would want to see anyone die apart from him. The Bible tells me that. So if the Bible tells me that, that tells me something about the heart of God, the heart of our Father. It tells me something about the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ whom I serve. If one takes a closer look at the Bible, when you will quickly realize that throughout the pages, I've just said that, there's always some sort of continual warning. I challenge you, please for heaven's sake, buy yourself a Bible if you don't own one. Get one. The Japanese are coming. They are coming when you are relaxing. And when their planes came over the horizon, it was too late. They perished. Your adversary, the devil, is coming. And he is here. So God gives continual warning both 
to the ungodly, but more specifically to the Christian, those who belong to God. There is forever a warning given to people, non-Christian and Christian alike. Why do I say non-Christian? Because church, I look at all of you, you are the warning to the world. Start talking. Start talking. Start talking about the good news. Start striking up conversations, not of condemnation, but of salvation. You're the warning. You're the satiation in the kingdom. You are the, the alarms, the radar. If you're filled with the Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, if you belong to Him. So you have been warned. Now I want to go to the book of Matthew. We've been dealing with Matthew 24 um, on a regular basis on Tuesday nights, but I want to go to a section we haven't really dealt with, which has everything to do with this morning. As a warning to God's people, and I mean this is specifically to God's people. This is not to the unsaved. Matthew chapter 24, and I'm going to take you from verses 37 to 51. As I said, there's a lot of reading. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angel of heaven, nor the sun. By the way, nor the sun. I think that in, there are some manuscripts where that's been omitted on purpose. Why? Because the sun knew. The sun was God. The sun came to earth as God incarnate. So I don't think Jesus sat there thought, thought, I don't know when I'm coming back. He knew. He knew. So if you will it for this moment, you may omit that phrase, nor the sun. But concerning the day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So as of the days of Noah, so as in those days, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and they were drinking and they were marrying and they were giving in marriage until Noah entered the ark and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be standing in a field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. Remember he's talking to Jewish people. So they're doing their Jewish things, their farm things. If anyone's a farmer over here, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Two men will be grinding at the mill. Woman rather. Well, one will be taken, one will be left. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have left his house to be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour none of you expect. Who then is face faithful and wise? Now this is a rhetorical question. Who of you, church, and I'm talking to you, church, who of you is faithful and wise? By the way, and a bondservant of Christ, whom his master has set over his household to give them food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Blessed is that servant when his master comes and finds that servant who is the herald of his righteousness continually, living in truth, speaking truth, getting people to repent of the truth. When the master comes and he finds you doing that, that's what this is saying. You will be blessed for that. Truly I say to you, he will set you or him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink it with the drunkards exactly in the times of Noah, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect and at an hour when he does not know and listen to these terrible words. And he will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. Who are the hypocrites? Is he talking to religious people or is he talking to unsaved people? Who is he talking to? The religious people. He will take that person and put him where he belongs. With the religious people. With the hypocrites who don't know they. Though they say, Lord, 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 oh Jesus, hallelujah, come bless the Lord. And I'm not saying this to you people. I'm just saying in general. And he comes on that day and he finds you to have been a farce. He will cut you to pieces and put you where you belong, where there isn't weeping and gnashing 
of teeth. Christians are called to be. And what does Christian mean? You will recall. If you don't recall, I'll remind you. Amongst many other things, it means Christ follower. That's in those days they were first called Christians, says the book. I think of, yes, in Antioch. That's the book of Acts, am I right? In Antioch, in those days, they were first, first called Christians. Why? Because they were Christ followers. They were Christ emulators. They were doing what Christ was calling them to do. And if you call, or I, call ourselves Christians, then let me remind you, and as I've done before, to be a Christ follower is to be someone who not only obeys Christ, but wants to be like Him. You want to be like Him. I'm not going to say what takes place at my, uh, at, at my work, but my wife will know when I slip up, it grieves me. It grieves me so much because I know that I'm grieving my Lord. I'm not making this up and there's no halo, but my wife will tell you, I'll go to us, I've disrespected you, I'm sorry, and I've, I've dishonored God. We should be like that. Do I get that right all the time? Sometimes it takes me days, but I'm digressing. To be like Christ is to be a follower and to be like Him in all that He does. In other words, it's living our everyday lives being prepared. Yeah, in the book of Matthew 24, we have just read about Christians being ready at all times, just like in the days of Noah. Let me remind you again, they were warned for 120 years and none of them listened. None of them. Yet knowing the truth, knowing that, well, at least knowing the truth being preached, but not receiving that truth. They were continually warned about the imminent and ensuing danger, but they continued as verses 38 to 39 says, for in those days, before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, being married, given in marriage. They all knew about God, but yet rejected Him. You want to cross-reference that? You want to see some, something strange in Scripture? Go to Romans 1. Write that down. Romans chapter 1 tells you, although they knew God, they did not worship Him as God. They gave no allegiance to God. That's what Romans 1 tells us. And again, let me remind you, those people... In Genesis 4.26, as I read, you, read to you, an emphatic tells you, in those days, people began to call on the name of the Lord. The very next chapter in chapter 5, it starts with the generation of Noah. In chapter 6, it comes with a warning from God. In chapter 7, it just, it is finished. You are warned. But they all knew about this. But even within churches today, within churches like this, within churches like any other church, it could be a home group, could be a home cell, it could be in a casual conversation, you will always find those that they are presented with the truth, irrefutable truth. We're not talking philosophical stuff here. We are talking objective stuff that you can see that's presented to them. Yet they will refute and refuse it and reject it outrightly. Matthew 24, 40 to 42. Where, where is that? Am I walking away from the camera? My wife's warned me for the third. This is my final warning. And the next one's dismissal. 40, right? Then two men will be in a field. One will be taken away and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken away and one left. Therefore stay awake. For you do not know what day the Lord is coming. What does that mean? Well, I want to burst your bubble. The one taken away is not the one taken to Jesus. The woman... Left in the field is not the woman who has been forsaken by Jesus. And the man who is working and stays behind is not the one. That word taken away is exactly the meaning of being swept away by a flood. So be aware, because when the Lord comes, He gives you a, a, para, a parable, a parabolic analogy 
of it will be like two people. You and I, Daniel. Akinyeh. And we'll be doing our thing. And when the Lord comes, the one remaining, if that's you, and I was the hypocrite, like a flood I will be swept away to where? To where there will be gnashing and weeping of teeth. I'm saying that we get the Bible wrong, but we do not read what the Bible says. We read two men left in the field. There's a song written about that. But what it's saying is stay awake, be alert. Because just like in the days of Noah, they were eating, being merry, marrying, being given in marriage. And then suddenly it, the flood came and took, swept them away. And the ones that remained were the ones that were safe in the righteousness of God. Because they truly belonged to Christ. That is the ark analogy, and that's the very same analogy that the Lord is using here. The one that is safe is going to be the one that is going to be safe in the ark. The safety, the safekeeping of Jesus. The one swept away, taken away, is the one that has been warned and warned and warned. And yet, unprepared. All religious stuff, but absolutely caught with your pants down, like the Americans. So by the way, the erroneous teaching that has been going through our churches all these years is that Jesus Christ is coming back, and sorry, forgive me, I know we speak about this on a Tuesday night, but Jesus Christ is coming back, and then he's going to, in a twinkling of an eye, the guy, the, the, the two men, the one taken away is going is to be with Jesus. And um, the woman with Jesus. And then Jesus doesn't make a three-point turn. He makes a, just a complete U-turn and goes back to heaven. And the whole world goes to tribulation and Armageddon and all this other stuff's going to happen. That's, that, that's not what the Bible is saying at all. It doesn't say that. If you heard that teaching, completely er eradicate that teaching. It's not what it's saying. There's context here. The text says the very opposite to what we have been taught as evangelicals, as a grach. We have been taught that in our churches for all our lives. That there will be sudden disappearance of, of the saints. Yes, there will be. And we'll go there and I will show you there will be a disappearance. But not the disappearance that you're thinking of. And this text has been distorted by charismatics, evangelical, ev evangelicals, uh, uh, Protestants, charismatics, you name them. For all our years we've been thinking that in a twinkling of an eye, the Bible says that, in a twinkling of an eye. But Jesus is likening that day to the days of Noah. The flood that destroyed mankind took, swept those who were left. Swept them. Well, wow. Those were taken away. The one left was safe in the ark. So that analogy, that parable in Genesis fits very neatly into Matthew 24 because that's exactly what Jesus is saying. You need to see the severity and the emphasis of what Jesus is saying. Just like the ones who did not enter the ark, they were swept, taken away. It is the same with those who do not belong to Christ at this time, in the same manner, they will be taken, swept. Swept is actually a very strong word. It, have you seen a raging river? We've seen. We've seen what a raging river does. We used to ride tubes on a raging river. In fact, I don't even think that would have been a raging river then. Because we came out alive on the other end. Daye. Some went from Windsor Dam, some went from the Weir. Kevin, I know you'll remember that. Uh, I, was, I wasn't a man. I used to just take it from the bridge over here. I've never come from Windsor Dam. I thought that was the shorter distance. But a raging river, you have to understand a tsunami that's coming in and it just obliterates and crushes everything those left behind in there. Just takes them away. It's not the other way around. People will be going on with their everyday lives just like we should do, by the way. We should be working. 
That, that's who we are. We should be going on. We're human beings created to do what we do. We should be going on about the busyness of our lives. But we have to be prepared on a daily basis. We don't know. In other words, we need to live our lives that emulate and glorify the Lord Jesus every single day. And when I say that, I know there's a bit of a, 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 a hint of impossibility over there because we are fallen creatures and we don't get that right every day. Let's just agree upon that. Right? But it should be leading us to repentance very quickly thereafter. Can I say that? And would you agree with that? You're going to fall? Are you going to repent? Jesus knows you all too well. All too well. So Matthew 24, 42 says, Stay awake, for you do not know on what day the Lord is coming. Jesus is not talking about physical sleep here, by the way. He's talking about spiritual sleep. That apathetic stage where you've just lost interest. It's like most of the youth groups, and I'm going out on a limb over here now, but most youth groups, you will have the poor old youth pastor preaching from Sunday, Friday night, every Friday night, and 99% of the youth are there just for the tea and cookies, and maybe for a bit of nookie. That's what they're there for, and we think we're doing, a, we do, we're doing our, our time of service. Oh, I've got 100 people at youth tonight, praise God. Well, 99%. How do I know that? When I went to youth first, I used to go there with my clip drift, my gin, and my obies. Right? They knew me all too well. Right? Because I said, hello, hello, everything's hidden. Do my roll call and everything to the bush. Get fraught. And so did most of the other youth come get fraught with me. Why have I actually said that? It's talking about spiritual sleep. Apathy. That's what we should be preaching to young people. That's what we should be preaching to the church. We should be saying, be alive, be well, be awake. The only way you can be awake is like Douglas told me just now. You know what, Shane? You wake up 2 o'clock in the morning. Pick up that Bible. I said, yo, what, you asked me what you were doing. I said, I was reading my Bible because I couldn't sleep. He says, good, that chases the demons away. Hallelujah! That's what we should be doing. Is being awake, prepared. The king is coming. Asande. Asanda. Just so many Christians, people, listen, who are living their don't care attitude, lifestyles, apathetic. And then there's so many people who think, I'm a Christian, I go to church, I do the churchy things, I belong to the women's group, I belong to the prayer group, I belong to the um, Dankitani group, and I belong to the hand at Cook Sisters group, and I, hand, and I belong to this, and I belong to that, and I'm a deacon, and I'm this, and I'm that, and you are completely far from God. And they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. They may know of Him, but they do not know him, neither do they literally serve him. And when I say serve him, your service to the church, whatever you do in your churches, wherever you do, that is a good thing. The Bible calls us to do that. Don't get me wrong. But when we serve Christ, it means we are his. And he is our Lord. What he says, we do. That's what it means to serve. We love to serve one another. We call to serve one another. Glenn is right. Glenn is right. She, she, she's got a servant's heart. She does. I know she does. But that's not the serve that's talking here. It means your heart is his. Look at that. If they truly knew him, their very lives would reflect his image. But it seems that many Christians live in exactly the same way as the world does and we cannot tell the difference between the world and the Christian. I don't have anything against tattoos by the way. I don't want a tattoo myself um, but you, you would have a guy belonging to the Hells Angels who's got tattoos from top to bottom and you'll have a Christian who's got tattoos from top to bottom. Who's the Hells Angels guy? No one can tell the difference. 
I've just picked on tattoos. I, uh, please, if you've got a tattoo, I'm go ahead. Have two more. I'm just saying, there's, there are Christians, you cannot even tell the difference between them and the world. They look exactly the same. Christian means Christ follower. Christian means you are like Christ. And if we are like Christ, I promise you, Jillian, would you agree with us? We have people that come into our store, Muslims, who recognize the presence of God immediately. Am I right? I'm not a great cop, but I want to be like him. That's what we should be doing. God calls us to live as Christians apart from the world, not like the world. Apart from the world system, not like the world system. That's why there's so many Christians unprepared. Because there's a false gospel going out that the Japanese are not going to attack. God is love. We're fully equipped. I'm there at youth on Fridays. I'm there at the prayer meeting on Wednesdays. I'm there on Sundays. I hear the word. Yes, it's so lovely, but completely unprepared because you do not know the one whom the word is speaking about. I'm challenging you as I challenge myself. Sweetheart, 1 Peter 4. We are exhorted to do this. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Verse 3. For the time that it's past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sens sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgy, dr drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised. Now, hold on. Hold on. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them. Come on. Most Christians join them anyway. What he's saying is they should be surprised when you don't do that anymore. You've said no. No more. There's the line. No more. I did that no longer. Ah, oh, you cluster cookie. Ah, oh, you monk. Ah, oh, you all this and ah, oh, you all that. So what? I belong to the king. That's our anthem. We are unashamed of the gospel of Christ. I've told you this over and over and over again. With respect to this verse 4, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. You become a malignant cancer to them. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. That through jud though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. What does it mean preaching to the dead? Well, I'll tell you what it means preaching to the dead. Anyone who is apart from Christ is dead in Christ. Anyone who belongs to Christ is alive in Christ. You are alive, and if you're alive, you're free. And if you're freed, you are free indeed. So the gospel, our heraldry, what we proclaim, should be speaking to dead people so that by God's grace they might come alive. Do you see? That's why we are to be prepared. How are you to be prepared? If you are given a job, I don't know, uh, you, to give me a job, I'm going to work for you at Uber. What, what job could I get? Just a simple job. Assistant. Your assistant. So I sweep the floor. So I get to sweep the floor, right? So I'm prepared. That's the agreement between you and I. I'm prepared to sweep the floor. But in the second hour, I want a raise now. And if I don't get a raise, I'm going to strike. Bye-bye. Now, why did I say that? <laughs> Thank you. Are you following me? Thanks for reminding me. I tell you, family, sometimes the Word of God, just that when, when I read it, it just it fills me up. 
It really does. It fills me up. I think I plan a sermon and I go all over the place for forgive me. Um, because the Word of God is alive. It's breathing. Matthew 25, and I think we need to end. Matthew 25, 1 to 10, the parable of the ten virgins. I'm not going to get too deeply into it because of time. But let's read it together, all ten virgin uh, v- verses. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps. Actually, those lamps don't mean a lamp like that little thing. It's a torch. It was a stick, quite long. You know how the Romans used to walk around, all the people of the ancient east, with a big flaming luppy on top. That's the lamp talking about here. It's not a little lamp with oil and stuff like that. It's actually a flaming torch. So then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their flaming torches and went to meet the bridegroom. Why do they have torches? So they can see where they're going. And so that the bridegroom can see that they are coming. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry. Can I repeat that? But I want to actually do that dramatically because this is what it means. At midnight there was a cry! Hail! The bridegroom has arrived! That's what it means. The cry. Suddenly! He's here! And he's been announced. Come out to meet him in that same equal, loud voice. Come! Come! Come meet him! You who are ready! Then all the virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to the bar, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in and with him to the marriage feast, and shut the door was shut. Afterwards, the, virgin, the, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord. That sounds familiar. Lord, Lord. Open to us, but he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day or the hour. I'm not going to get into the deep theology about lamps and what the oil means. That's not the point of the parable. I'm not going to get into the, the, the theology of what the flame means or what the stick means or what the holder means or what the luppy means. It's a parable. So when you read the parable, watch Jesus say, in this parable can I hear from you thank you that's the point of the parable it's not how much give me oil in my jeep keep me going 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 how's that song go give me oil and, and pray that's not what it's saying you've got the oil be prepared who's the oil the one who resides in you Jesus Christ the Holy Spirit is your oil he's the one that you shine who amongst you who who takes a lamp and puts it under a bushel instead of putting on a hill for all to see who amongst you would do that none of you therefore be prepared who amongst you would not be prepared with enough oil and just your stick and your temporary burning light I went to church on Sunday yay But yeah, be prepared day in and day out. And yes, may we say, give me oil in my lamp, sweet Jesus. Give me oil in my my heart, my soul, my spirit, sweet Holy Spirit. Come fall afresh on me. Get your new, your mercies are new every single morning. I need you now, today, tomorrow. So therefore, the irony of Pearl Harbor and the irony of the coming of Jesus is exactly, exactly the same. It's the same thing. By the way, you need to know Jesus talking to a group of Jews. 
who have Jewish background and they knew what oil meant and they knew what a wick meant. They knew Jesus wasn't saying too much about the wick. In fact, if I can just say it, it was like possibly a, a metal cage with a lappy inside it and they would soak it in oil or pour the oil on it and that would keep on burning for a while, keep on burning for a while. You will notice in the parable they all fell asleep as well. They all fell asleep, the good and the bad. So don't read too much in the sleep either, right? Matthew 24 says stay awake spiritually. Matthew, uh, Ma Matthew 25, 1 to 10 has got nothing to do with staying awake spiritually. So, well, go. You're normal. You're a human being. You need to rest. Go lie on your pillow. Have your sleep. But even while you're sleeping, give me oil in my heart, Lord. I need it, Lord. So that if you come, and when they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready, says verse 25. Can you notice one thing? And then I said I want to end. I'm going to say it one more time. I want to end. The bridegroom came to the bride. The bride never went to the bridegroom like we've been taught. And you sucked up into the air. No. Jesus is coming down to the bride and he's coming to meet the bride and there's going to be a cry going out but this time not from some herald across the street but by an angel a host of angels by the living God because 1 Thessalonians 4 13 to 18 says this but we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep you that you may not grieve as others do you have who have no hope for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again even so through Jesus God will bring him those uh, with him those who have fallen asleep for this we declare to you by the word from the Lord that we who are alive we who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep I'll explain that to you next time um, if we have a chance for the Lord himself now listen for the Lord himself verse 16 will descend from heaven with a cry a command with the voice of an archangel it might be Michael it might be Gabriel but it's going to be the voice of his top top herald that the king has come and the dead in Christ will rise and then those who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with Him to meet Him in the air. And so they will always be with the Lord. So again, there will be a disappearance. But the disappearance is the delegation to come. O oh Lord, come. We've come to meet you. And you've come down to earth to be with your bride. That's what it means. Jesus does not make a U-turn there. By the way, it ends with verse 18. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. He starts off to say, do not be uninformed. It means do not be willfully ignorant. Do not stay. Do not say you never knew the truth or continue in your sin. Those three meanings. Don't be ignorant. Don't continue in your sin. And don't say you never knew. And then let me end and say, encourage one another with these words. What does it mean? I found it completely un astounding when I read what this actually means. It means this, you people, and now we're going to pray. It means you people, how are you to encourage one another with these words? You are to make a call from close beside each other. Close beside each other. That means we're on guard for each other. We're standing guard all the time for one another. What? To pray friendship, whenever we see each other. That's what encouraging each other with these words means. Believers are to personally make a call which offers up evidence of the Christ that is in them. You don't just go with a pamphlet, pamphlet to and stand on a soapbox and say, Jesus is Lord, you're going to hell. Who cares? But yeah, it's saying, listen, let me explain to you. I'll come aside you. Let's reason together. Family. Family. 
If you want to cross-reference that, go and read Romans 3 verse 4 and 9, 28. You'll see the same thing. And then it also means to address and speak to one another, call to one another, reason with one another, which may be done in a way of exaltation. And then it says also beg that person you're seeing falling. Beg him. What does the book of Jude say? If you see your brother falling into the flame, snatch him out. It's like that, please, please do not do this. I, I love you too much. Don't. So it means beseech, beg, come around, go at each other. Just be what a normal family would do. If my son were to ride, remember my son first learned, uh, Christian learned to ride bicycle. He ran, went straight in front of a car after I told him not to. I thought my son was going to be dead. I gave him such a smack. Because I've got the fright. I know there's people that believe that you shouldn't smack your kids. I believe you should smack your kids. So I besieged him. I warned him, don't do that again. You will die. It's the same thing here. Encourage one another with these words. The king is coming. Be ready. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We understand that it was rather lengthy. But Lord, your word is so full of truth. How do we even shorten this? It's beyond me. But one thing I do know, Lord Jesus, your word says to us this morning, we are to be ready. In and out of season. Father, you know what we, we are but sinful. I want to I even say what David says. Lord, you know my heart is prone to wonder. You know me all too well. Where can I hide from you? If I go to the depths of the sea, there you will find me. If I go across the land, there your spirit will be with me. If I go into the grave, there you will find me. If I go into the sky, you will find me. You know me all too well. You knit me together. You have breathed your life into me. You know me. You're inescapable. So I want to be prepared with all that truth, with everything that you have shown us, with everything that we really do know about you. Father, let us embrace that as a church, as a people, even as new guest visitors. Embrace that, that we go out, Lord, being Christians and being prepared for we do not know the day nor the hour when the cry from heaven will take place. Holy Spirit, breathe on us. In Jesus' name, Amen.